First of all, welcome everybody. I'm Joseph Cohen. I'm a professor in the sociology department here at Queens College in the City University of New York. And I'm here with two of my colleagues who I'll ask to introduce themselves. First, the uh, co-director of the Queens Podcast Lab and professor in the English department, Jason Tuga. Jason? Thanks, Joe. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Jason Tuga. I think a lot of you know me already. I'm a professor in the English department, uh, co-director of the Queen's Podcast Lab and the faculty advisor for the Night News here at Queen's College. And we are also joined by Anthony Borelli, uh, one of our team members. Anthony, do you want to introduce yourself? Uh, thank you. Hi. Yes, my name is Anthony Borelli. Um, I'm an intern for the Podcast Lab this semester. I'm a part of the Accelerated Media Studies Master's Program, so I'm mm. with a uh, an undergrad and a grad, which is interesting. And I've worked in radio before at my previous college and have some experience with podcasting and Adobe from uh, a premiere and audition. So whatever I can do to help, I'm here. And um, yeah. Well, it's great to have you. And welcome to everybody here in the uh, Zoom session and those of you joining us on YouTube either live or after the fact this is a lesson on the basics of podcast production um, if you've ever been interested in starting a podcast but you don't know what's involved in a technical uh, on a technical level today's lesson is going to cover some of these basics but before we start let me just uh, put in a couple of announcements get the slideshow going. All right. Um, next Friday at lunchtime, join us for a discussion with Jamie Cohen, author of Producing New and Digital Media with Rutledge Press. Jamie is going to offer an introduction to the field of media production. So if media production is something you love, it's a you know, a, a craft or a hobby you've thought of taking up, or if it's a line of work that you've thought of pursuing, this is a great chance to meet a professional producer. We're going to talk about things like what do media producers do? What's the difference between, you know, a run of the mill and a great producer uh, lessons that, you know, seasons, pr seasoned producers wish they had known at the start and advice for those who want to get into the field of professional production. That's next Friday and you can catch it on the Queen's Podcast Lab YouTube channel. If you want to be here on the Zoom, you can uh, write to me at uh, joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu. Also, later this month, faculty are invited to join us for a discussion about digital content creation and the work of faculty. This is a Zoom meeting. It won't be simulcast to YouTube Live, but we might use excerpts in uh, a podcast or a web video. In this discussion, we're going to talk about how communications and information technology is changing the way uh, academics do their work. They're breaking the old communication monopolies that we used to rely on, and they're creating new competitors, but also new opportunities for us to do the kind of work that we do. If you're interested in these types of topics, we're going to talk about the new kinds of media that are affecting our profession and how people use them. Uh, join us. It's a Zoom conversation. It's open to uh, faculty or interested students from any discipline or any institution. Uh, if you're interested, write to me, joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu. Oh, Anthony, Anthony pointed out. Thank you, Anthony. That's Friday, September 24th, not Friday, September 10th. So that's a mistake. It's the 24th. Thank you, Anthony. There are a lot more planned events, uh, learning events that we have uh, for this upcoming semester. Check out our uh, events at queenspodcastlab.org slash events. Two in particular, on the 1st and the 15th, we're going to have some other learning sessions that talk about uh, other aspects of running podcasts. On October 1st, we'll run a mini lesson on developing a podcast franchise, you know, planning, uh, uh, developing format and things like that. And on October 15th, we're going to talk about the performative part of podcasting, hosting, interviewing, show prep, and things like that. Mark it on your calendar, as well as uh, the talks from the other great people that we got lined up. 
Um, today we're going to talk about podcast production. Best way to do it is to just go out there and try it. And if you try it and you have an episode that you like, you think it's pretty good, uh, send it to us. Uh, we'd be happy to put it on if it fits our uh, shows. If you are a sociology faculty member or graduate student from any institution, we're interested in hearing what you've made uh, and we can put it up on the Annex Sociology podcast. That's a podcast we run. And if you are a student faculty or staff member at Queen's College, uh, we have the QC pod. It's a, sort of an open mic podcast in the college radio tradition. You can learn more about that podcast by checking it out on our website, queenspodcastlab.org slash QC pod, or go to iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcast, ask your smart st speaker to play the latest episode of the QC pod. You can hear what we do there. Today's presentation, we're going to be talking about a specific part of the content creation process, podcast post-production. Uh, this is the task of taking all the raw audio that you're going to use in your show and putting it together into a coherent, uh, rewarding audience experience. We're going to talk about the tasks involved in this program, and we're going to show you the very basics of how to uh, produce a podcast from raw audio using a pretty good quality freeware program called Audacity. Uh, again, this tutorial is the very basics uh, of how to do an interview or conversation format podcast, which is one of the easier uh, uh, types of podcasts to get started with. Uh, and I'm joined here by uh, my colleagues, Anthony and Jason. You guys can just chime in as you deem fit uh, uh, at any point in, in the discussion. Um, so, but before we start with that, I wanted to talk about what part of the podcast production process we're going to be talking about today. This is post-production is what we're going to be talking about. This is what happens after the microphones turn off, after everybody's gotten their archival audio, the music, the sound effects that they want. This is the part of uh, process of stitching together a podcast to something polished and uh, a high quality listening experience for an audience member. Um, for those of you who are curious about how podcasting works technically on a general level, here's a flow chart. So when you guys, can you see my uh, mouse here? Can you see the mouse? Yes. All right. Wonderful. Thank you. All right. So you as a listener, when you download a podcast, you have this impression that you are going to iTunes or Spotify, Google Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts, and that you're downloading the file from them. For most of podcast history and over most platforms, though, that's not how it works. This is how it works. Somebody creates an audio file an experience, and they upload it to a website, usually a website that runs on a blogging platform, like WordPress is very popular. Um, and you can run that site, a WordPress site on a, an internet hosting provider like the university or GoDaddy or Amazon Web Services. Uh, there are many specialty web hosting providers for podcasts specifically, Podbean, Buzz, Buzzsprout, uh, Blueberry, Spreaker, Libsyn, Simplecast. I use a program called Castos. There's a bunch, okay? But you upload your podcast to an internet server and you do it as a, as a, uh, 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 as a blog. And on a blog, you, ha you have something called an RSS feed. It's a small text file that talks about all of the new posts that you've had. And you make an RSS feed that only tracks posts that you mark as podcasts and you register it with Spotify, with iTunes, with Google, with all of those uh, podcasting services that we know and, and, and that we use to access our podcasts. And when you subscribe on iTunes to a podcast, like say uh, the New York Times Daily, what iTunes will do is it will monitor the SS, RSS feed of the New York Times blog. And when the special RSS feed for podcasts says there's a new episode, it will publish it to the website and it might give you the listener a notice and you'll download it from the web server and listen to it on your computer or your cell phone. 
Um, today we're talking about this part right here, uh, creating audio files. We're going to talk about a part of the process where we create the audio files. Creating the audio files themselves, that's a multi-step process. Uh, you don't just grab a microphone, start babbling, and then post it to the internet. It will lead to a, a disorganized and overall unsatisfying uh, experience. My, in my research of established podcasters and in our own experience creating podcasts here at the Podcast Lab, we found that what people do is they tend to use a multi-step process. They deliberately plan their episodes and then they go out and they curate the raw sounds that will be used in constructing the audience experience. They'll, they might uh, record a, a discussion session or go out and record sounds or download sound effects or music from a, a third party. And they'll dump them all into a drive. And once you've accumulated all the sounds that you're going to use in your podcast, then it's your job to stitch them together in a meaningful, coherent audience experience. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Once you create a polished, coherent experience, you deploy it to the internet. You upload it to your server. iTunes recognizes it. The listeners come see you and the cycle uh, runs its course. Concretely, or, or well, so basically, this is a depiction of what you're going to be doing at, at this stage that we're going to talk about today, audio post-production. So you take the speech, you take the music, the sound effects, whatever's going to be in the final experience, and you're, really, you're, you're compiling it together. And the way that you do it is you use a media production program that gives you a timeline and you drop audio files into the timeline and decide when people are going to hear what sounds or music or speech and you can alter the elements of the timeline you can you know fade music in or out change its volume all sorts of effects but basically you're 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 putting raw audio on a timeline and orchestrating a listening experience and if you do a good job you got a good podcast so post production is more than just a technical job there are real creative decisions to be made in this part of the creative process. And a good producer is able to leave their own stamp on a podcast to uh, make the podcast better or something that it wouldn't have been had the uh, producer not invested their own creative energies into the final product. So the first step when you approach the task of podcast production, I recommend that you assume the posture that it is your job to contribute to the audience final experience. It's your job to make sure the podcast sounds good. It's your job to make sure it has the type of character or it meets the goals that it's, it's trying to uh, achieve and that the stories and discussions being conveyed, conveyed are being conveyed in a, a comprehensible and engaging way. You can do a lot of stuff when you're a producer. All right. In post-production, that's where we decide what, what's included in the podcast. What, are, what, what moments of the discussion are the audience, is the audience going to get to see? What parts of our archival review, which, which audio clips that we pulled from the vault are people going to see? And what parts get cut out? What are we going to hide? Anthony, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah, just a little anecdote. One of the first mm -hmm. times I ever tried to do a podcast with my friends kind of like an experiment just to have some fun with the uh with two of my friends i noticed in the editing process how much uh how much i cut out and how seamless it can be you don't know you could cut out five minutes of a conversation but the end point and the beginning point like with that whatever you cut out in the middle when that's gone you can find the spot where those two like there's two points meet and it doesn't feel like you've lost the beat. It doesn't feel yep. like you missed anything, skipped anything. When you're listening to something, you don't know what you're missing. You don't yep. know what got cut. And that's the sign of a good edit. And uh, I also think that something that people don't think about is breathing a lot. Mm -hmm. 
people are breathing and going and huh, like they're making little noises and you never hear that they get yeah. cut out often they get silenced yeah. often and We're- you'll notice that more the more you listen to a podcast yeah totally we'll talk about that but you are right when you're able to cut out a minute of an exchange and it doesn't change the character that means you were babbling and it's probably less less compelling content it's easier said than done i'm sure anthony will attest like it's 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 much harder to figure out how to cut it it's not a mindless job you actually need to be well versed in the subject matter and have an ear and be thoughtful to do it well jason uh yeah, I just want to chime in with and add to what Anthony was saying and give an anecdote that involves one of our student hosts. Mm-hmm. So right now I'm teaching a podcasting course in the English department, and we've been talking about the fact that when you are both gathering your audio and editing your audio, you you do want to present yourself. You want to be yourself, but you want to be a particular version of yourself, mm-hmm. right? You want to be your smartest most interesting self, the one that you want the audience to see. And last semester, uh, one of our students, Samantha Galvez Montiel, made a few really good podcasts for us. And we went around and around with drafts of editing. And when she finally started to get pretty ruthless with the editing, she became so pleased with the results and was saying, oh, now look how smart I sound. Yeah. Whereas before, I feel like I just sounded like a any old student, now I sound like an expert, right? And yeah. that, and she did that through editing. And partly what, what happened was through editing, she realized she wanted to re-record some of her audio so that it sounded sharper. And in, in the process of doing that, she and anybody else doing the same process will start to um, gain an ear for collecting audio with editing in mind, right? And that's when you really start having something you can craft really well. So true. So true. And and it is true that, you know, editing your audio, editing your speech, editing monologues or lectures that you give, it's like editing a paper. And if you read all of our first drafts, you'd be much less impressed than what it looks like when it goes into publication because it's just well manicured. And now with technology, it's easy for us to create well manicured audio as well as text. It was harder Mm -hmm. in, in, in past eras. But definitely, definitely uh, clipping out stuff and making making yourself sound polished and succinct is a great way. You, you realize your ideas can be good. And sometimes your communicative flaws are getting in the way of what are fundamentally good ideas. And it, mm-hmm. it, a lot of people experience being having their audio edited as a, uh, a confidence enhancing experience because they're mm-hmm. like, wow, you know, when you. Most people hate to listen to themselves, mm-hmm. but once they start listening to themselves edited, they're like, you know what? I'm not so dumb. This is kind of smart. And people yeah. like it. It's true. Yeah. It- I mean, not only that, if you if you go through several editorial cycles, you'll start realizing what's the spot in my voice that I use that I actually like, yeah. right? And and that I want people to hear, right? And, yeah. that, and then it really starts to get fine-tuned. That's why it's good to do your own production at least for some of it because yeah. you'll understand yourself as if you're, if you're a host, if you're a performer, which we'll talk about in a different session, if you're a performer in the podcast, you'll get a better understanding of your performance. If you edit yourself, that's for sure. Mm-hmm. There's other things though. I, I just wanted to make sort of a list of, of ways that producers sort of co-author the audience experience. Producers can also in post-production, we can also order the experience, right? You can develop a hook and put it at the front. That's like a really great exchange or a funny moment. And you put it right at the beginning of a podcast. So that it's like a promise to the audience. It's like, you enjoyed this exchange. You're going to get a lot of this stuff in the hour to come. And people will jump on board. Uh, Anthony, do you want to say something on this? Uh, I just had a great example. I listened to this podcast called Dungeons and Daddies. It's a um, a Dungeons and Dragons podcast where uh, the campaign is that like their four dads from our world flung into the forgotten realm. That's literally their log line for the uh-huh. whole show. And every episode, like the, uh, they do like a little fake advertisement that recaps what happened in the last episode. And it's such an engaging way to bring people in. And it's not like a previously on, although they have made that joke before. Sometimes they'll do like a fake, like, 
ad for a character called the mall who they go to buy things from because there's no actual mall. Like stuff like that. Like yeah. very silly fun keeps you hooked, keeps the like it and it keeps developing the narrative. So that was just a great example that I can remember. That's that. awesome. Yeah. Beta, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just have a question. Did you receive like um my email that I sent you? You know what? Let's talk about that after the uh, okay. YouTube live cast. All right. Uh, Jason, did you have something to add or is the hand? Uh, is it- I could add one, one thing related to what Anthony was saying. Um, there's a podcast called Periodic Talks that's hosted by two actors, um, an actor from Community and an actor from NCIS. Mm-hmm. And they... Uh, uh, their first names are Gillian and Dion. I can't remember their last names, but they start Gillian. every episode with one of their friends who happen to all be kind of famous actors giving a really weird STEM fact, some science fact that is just something bizarre about the world. Yeah. And it's like a two minute thing right at the top of every episode. And it just grabs you, you know, yeah. and, the, and just like there are ways to uh, cons- to structure your podcast so that you get people because it's really easy to lose people's attention really quickly. Right. So it's designed for that. So getting a hook is something you can do. You can also reorder the experience to frame discussions. That means present stuff at the start to you or to, you know, make the audience see a topic a certain way or get them in a particular mood or, uh, you know, sort of set the groundwork for everything else you're going to present. You can, in in my podcast, I have more of an information podcast and I uh, will sometimes put explanatory material at the front, stuff that a general audience might not know, but needs to know to understand everything that's going to happen after. Or you can reorder experience to develop narrative. I'm loath to talk about narrative because Jason is, uh, you know, a recognized expert in that field, but like, you know, telling a story, I'm going to stop because I'm going to embarrass myself. But yeah, you know what I mean. You're good. I think you can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I know better to talk when I'm not the expert in the room on topics of... Uh... <laughs> Anyhow, post-production cleans up sound and speech. You can get rid of ticks or noises that might distract the uh, listener. Uh, when you do it really well and you create that studio sound, you can make a podcast sound really professional. You can add music and sound effects to change the environment to influence audience emotion and impart an intended impression, you know. And uh, you can manipulate how interactions are perceived by doing things like playing with silence and spacing. Uh, I'll give you an example. Sometimes silence communicates something about an interaction and it sets the emotional, you know, sort of sets the emotional uh, tenor of an interaction. I'll give you an example, Mm -hmm. right? Think of two scenarios. One where someone says, would you like to go to my show? And then immediately like, yeah. Or you say, let me check my calendar. So if Jason says, would you like to go to my show? And I say, let me check my calendar immediately after he says it. That's different than me saying, would you like to go to my show? And the person pauses and says, let me check my calendar. The space where you're assuming someone's thinking about whether or not they actually want to go or whatnot is telling you something. Even though nothing was spoken, information was conveyed by a silence. And you can use silences or get rid of silences to play with meaning, to play with interactions. You can, uh, for example... Um, uh, I, I wanted to say spacing in science conveys emotional energy. When you make people's, the start of people's sentences immediate follow the end of other people's sentences, it creates a high energy impression. When you add spacing, it lowers the energy, makes the, the pace seem slower. And you can do that in post-production. Anthony, did you want to say something? I was just going to add to that. Um, use it, like we were talking about editing earlier, cutting out like gaps and spaces and such and that's not always the case you can leave in a space a gap a silence a moment of silence because that mean that is conveying something and it can fit more than it can hurt sometimes it can work more than it can like you don't always have to cut things you just have to hear what you what you recorded you have to really listen 
they'll just cut out everything that is dead air because sometimes dead air is funny sometimes dead air is serious it's a moment yeah. of silence you don't know that's a great observation you're right don't just go making everything tight you're 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 imposing a creative decision you know it has to fit and that's why you got to start with the audience experience like when you start a process you should know what the show's about you should know what the show tries to do to its audience members, how the show, you know, the, the type of experience it tries to deliver and then make your use of spaces and silences and stuff consistent with that. Jason, did you want to say something? Yeah, just that also you can add silence if if you want a gap. I'm thinking of an example from uh, an episode of 99% Invisible with Roman Mars that's about bats and it begins with these people kind of having a debate about bats in Austin, Texas. And he delivers it like this. I don't remember the exact words, but it's basically like, and what they're arguing about is bats like that. Whereas let's just say if it had been spoken like this and what they're arguing about is bats. Yeah. Right. That sounds like no big deal. Right. But he adds drama by, in, by inserting the silence. Yeah. It's like, a, wait for it. Yeah. Bats. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I love it. So all of this is to say that if you are involved in post-production, you are very much a creator and doing a good job in post-production really adds to the final experience and can be extremely important to a podcast. So it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's an important job and it's a skilled job and it's a creative job. And uh, good editing is a really important part, I think, of having a successful podcast. So if podcast production is about moving content over a timeline in a media production program, you're going to need to use a program. And today I'm going to show you the basics of podcast production on a free program called Audacity. And you can download it to your own computer using the URL. Now, a warning, we have very recently, there has been news of concerns about Audacity's privacy. Uh, and we have not been able to vet it. We've used Audacity for a long time and we're going to show Audacity because uh, it's free. And uh, we're very much about open source and we try to show people how to do things in a way that doesn't cost them money, sort of consistent with our organizational goals at the City University of New York, uh, you know, just open and public. However, there is an issue with privacy. I haven't looked into it. I still am personally using Audacity, but that's the disclaimer, uh, something to think about. There are other programs, Pro Tools, Audition, Anthony, uh, other other software that you've worked with? Um, I use Adobe uh, Audition, but when I did my first internship at my radio station, I had to produce my own show. I used Audacity, Audacity exclusively mm. um, for like the first four or five out of ten, maybe the first three. And then things I did on my own when I didn't have money for Adobe – I would use um, Audacity because it does work. It is. It does crash more than other things. It's a free service, so like you're getting what you pay for, which is nothing. But yeah. for that price point, works as good as anything else you're going to get. As long as you know what you're doing, you can do anything with Audacity. Yeah. It's. Yeah. It's. Listen. If you're just starting out in podcasting, you don't want to spend a ton of money because the you know professional media production programs are very expensive. At least get your start on something free. And then I, once you're into it, sorry, Jason, go ahead. That's all right. I would just add, I also use Audition. I like it a lot. Uh, but a lot of students have GarageBand if they work mm -hmm. on a Mac and have experience with it. And that'll work fine, too. Oh, I missed a comment by Imran. And I wanted to uh, hear on Zoom. And I wanted to write it, read it. This was uh, pertaining to our earlier conversation about how producers add to the experience. Uh Imran writes, I forgot the name of the podcast, but it was an anthropology podcast and we could hear frogs and birds behind the voice. And the host mm -hmm. said it, he was recording it in a jungle type place. And it really added to the environment, uh, the sound dynamics. Yeah, totally. Right. Like music. It's about 
uh, it's about creating a whole experience for the listener and to have music and sound of it. Just you want to transport people if that's what you're about. And it can be very easy to do, especially when you're dealing with audio only. Like effects are so easy when there's no video aspect. Video can look bad. You can get away with free stuff on audio. Anyhow, let's get back to it. So we're going to talk about Audacity today. Um, and let's show you how uh, it works. Um, so before you start any project, what you should do is you should create a folder on your hard drive and you should take all the MP3 files or all the sound files. They might be MP3, WAV, whatever. You take all the sound files that you're going to use and you put them in the project folder. So they're all at the same place on your hard drive. Usually in podcasts, and for reasons we'll explain in a second, it's traditional uh, to record one voice track per person. So let's say Jason, Anthony, and I were going to record a podcast. We would talk, but we would re each record a soundtrack with just our voices on them. And there's a lot of benefits to doing it, uh, some of which I'll explain in a moment. So you dump all those on and uh, store any show notes or preparation material, anything that you had with that episode. And before you start, get all your stuff in one place. Jason. Did you have something? Uh, yeah, just a word of warning, something I learned the hard way. Uh, you do not want to store these files somewhere on your computer where they end up in the cloud because the software will lose track of them. So you want to be sure they're actually on your hard drive. And if you're getting serious and doing a lot, then you probably want to invest in an external hard drive that you can keep it all on. If you keep everything there and have a series of organized folders by episode, uh, it'll make your life a lot easier. And yeah. it, because your computer will fill up if you just keep pouring audio, audio files on it. Yeah. The only thing is, is some portable hard drives are slow to read and write data from, and it can really extend yeah. your production time. So be careful about that, but definitely it's best. So yeah, don't, it's better rather than do it on, one drive or dropbox or google cloud do it on your c drive do it on your d drive anthony wanted to show us your uh yes this is a passport it's an external hard drive i think this has uh either a terabyte or 50 or 60 or 100 or I, it's a lot of gigabytes or one terabyte which is you know a, a lot of gigabytes so yeah. definitely grab one of these and copy everything you work on. The one thing you should know more than anything, double, triple, save everything you do and have it on multiple different platforms on your computer, in a hard drive, or on your, yeah, saved on the, in a folder on your computer, saved in a folder on here. Send it to yourself in an email. If it crashes and you have not saved, you will never feel a pain worse than losing a project that you've worked <laughs> on for hours especially when it comes to editing editing can be tedious and it's rewarding when you're done but if you have to backtrack it's like mm, you're playing a video game and the save file corrupts and you have to start from the beginning you don't want <laughs> that you don't want that. so always yeah, be no. diligent <laughs> all right good very uh, it, it is and also well let's well, let's uh, show you in a second. So let's take a look at how this how this program works. Uh, and I'm going to show you sort of a few types of operations that you can engage in. And we're going to start with just importing your track. So take a look. Hold on. I'm going to get out of this share. And I'm going to get out of this. And hold on. I'm going to share my uh, desktop. Okay, so if you take a look at my desktop, uh, you'll see I have, I've uh, opened an Audacity project and I have a, a folder with uh, all of the uh, sound files that I'm going to use today. If you'd like to try these sound files, you can go to our website, queenspodcastlab.org and download the files yourself in a, a PDF production guide and you can practice along with us see what we do so i have some uh i have some uh 
practice audio that I recorded with my colleague, Ryan Sperry, who I interview with. And I'm going to just show you a few things that you can do. But before I do that, I just want to show you. So the first step, before you do anything, you have to drag the audio files into the audio editing program. And I'm just, all, all I'm going to do, I have them here in this folder, and I'm just going to drop them in to, uh, to uh, Audacity and uh, put them in there. Now, once they are in, the next step is, hold on, I'm gonna, gonna hold on. The, the, the next step is you want to, hold on, clean the audio. And that involves removing uh, background noises and adjusting the levels to make sure everybody's talking at the same level. So for, for background noise, uh, there is a function if you go to effects and you go to noise reduction. There is uh, an effect that will take a constant noise in your track and it will extricate it from the, uh, from the, from the particular track. So if you see here, this says Joseph Cohen, that's me. That's my part of the discussion. And this is my colleague, Ryan, who was, uh, uh, who was uh, speaking with me. And I'm going to, so here you can take a look. So for example, here, I'll give you a few seconds. I'm going to delete all of this. All right. Hopefully you can hear this. Hold on. No, you can't hold on. Uh, speakers. Uh, I believe it. Uh, just this personal pin. So we're going to start off Can with you hear that? the introduction, and uh, you'll put that on uh, on a bed of music we provided you with. Music. So here's the introduction. Welcome to the Fake Podcast. My name is Joseph Cohen, and today we're going. So I had some prefatory remarks. I was talking before the actual show began, and the actual show, the introduction begins here. Welcome to the Fake Podcast. My name is Joseph Cohen. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start the audio there. Now, when you take a look at my levels when I'm talking to the Fake Podcast, my name is Joseph Cohen. Quite loud. And today we're going to talk with... I can uh, lower the, uh, the volume uh, in a bunch of different ways. You don't want it up in the red. Welcome to the Fake Podcast. It means that there'll be Joseph some distortion. Cohen. You can and turn it down a little. To talk with... Ryan Sperry about podcast. And you want your audio to be peaking at the top of the green. The practice podcast. Happy <laughs> Ryan's less loud than me, but you can see Ryan's levels are also. Oh, he's happy to practice with beer. So, <laughs> so I've adjusted, I've adjusted the audio. So we're roughly at the same level. I can take background noise. I highlight uh, to, to, to erase the background noise on a channel, highlight a part where the person isn't speaking and you can only hear the fan running or the radiator, whatever is creating a consistent background noise. Not like the bird tweeting outside my... Yeah. You click get a noise profile and then you highlight the entire track or the part that you want to get rid of the persistent noise. And once you have gotten a noise profile, you press OK. And the program will extricate the consistent background noise. Once you have the uh, your tracks that are where everybody's roughly speaking at the same level, and there's no background noise, you're ready to move on to the next step. Is there anything that uh, Anthony or Jason you'd like to add about this phase, sort of the cleaning audio tracks? I guess I would just add that you wanna be careful with levels as you're recording as well, because you can get distortion that you can't remove if you record them too high. Yeah, always watch your, your levels, it's true. So when I was working on, I did a project where I was doing a, uh, a music show 
and I had to drag in all of the different songs. And you may not realize this, but every musician records at a different level. So making them all uh, hit the same is a lot harder than you think. Cause, and also yeah. this is the same thing with vocals. If somebody's talking loud or talking close to the mic and you lower that, you're going to hear the difference. Mm-hmm. If you don't really take the time to notice the level, you're going to hear the difference when somebody's lowered, like somebody's volume is lowered and somebody vol- somebody's volume is raised or one song comes in blaring and another comes in yeah. light. So you have to turn it up and down. Uh, mixing or not mixing. Um, I guess mixing the volumes is is definitely something you have to be focused on so i agree with jason you really need to make sure while you're recording the vocals are as even as they possibly be uh, can be so you should always do a test run in the beginning um i don't sit still so if you're having a guest on that maybe is like me doesn't sit still or doesn't sit you got to make sure that they know like you got to be right here in front of the mic so we hear you clearly, concisely, and you're the same volume the whole time. You know, you have to make sure that you communicate with whoever you're doing the show with so they know what you're getting into. And uh, you're just trying to make post-production as easy as possible for yourself afterwards or whoever edits for you. Totally. Great piece of advice. Okay, let me show you how to put a bed of music. So we, we, we cut out sort of the backstage talk. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a bit of music over my introduction um, just to show you how to, how it works. So take a look at what we're doing. Let's see. Just want to make sure I got the, the right screen here. All right. So I'm going to take this song. It's a freeware song called Soul Searching by Jerris. Okay. I'm going to drag it onto the Audacity window. And I'm going to move the track to the top, right over my introduction talk. So here, take a look. This is my introduction here. I'm going to mute the uh, music so you can hear the, the first part. Welcome to the Fake Podcast. My name is Joseph Cohen. And today we're going to talk with Ryan Sperry about podcasting. You're not going to want to miss this. Okay. So there's my introduction. I'm going to delete I'm going to delete most of this music track that I am working on. And so what I do is I make sure that the uh, selection tool is chosen. I'm going to left click on the timeline. I'm going to hold down the shift and press the end button to get rid of the entire song. And I'm going to press, just so you see it, I'm going to press the delete key and that erased the remainder of the music. I only want to use a clip of it. I'm going to use the uh, time shift tool and I'm going to push the two audio tracks down a little bit so that my speech, so that the listener hears the intro song for about three seconds before we speak. And then I'm going to highlight the part where I'm talking on the music track. If you use an effect called Auto Duck, Auto Duck, it will pull down the volume of the intro music while there is talking in the track directly below the music track, which is where I'm talking. So I'm going to press OK. And if you see, Auto Duck has lowered the volume while I was talking. Oh no, and I think I made a mistake here because I didn't leave enough uh, room, hold on. Okay, now let's start the main. Okay, I I cut out too much of the uh, music. So let me just do this. Push this to three seconds, this to three seconds. So my audio starts somewhere again. Selection tool while I'm talking. Effects, auto duck. And, and, and th- this video will be posted to YouTube so you can follow along and do it at home or you can read the written tutorial. And then I'm gonna, I'm going to bring in the interview. You see, this is where the interview starts. I'm gonna pull it back 
and I'm going to fade out the music. Fading out means the music is going to stop slowly and someone's going to start talking while the music's fading out. So I'm going to highlight the part that I want to fade out and I'm going to hit effect, fade out. And now listen, we have an, in, we have an introduction, listen. Welcome to the Fake Podcast. My name is Joseph Cohen and today we're going to talk with Ryan Sperry about podcasting. You're not going to want to miss this. Okay, now let's start the main part of the program. How's it going, Ryan? Okay, how's it going, Ryan? I'm just going to pull that out. Pull that in. I probably should have left the music running a little longer. And if we were doing this for real, I would say the fade was too short. But then the fade out comes. How's it going, Ryan? Pretty good. Thanks for having me on the Crackers podcast. And there you go. We, um, hold on. So... Basically, we uh, took some music, we arranged it on the timeline, we deleted portions, we added music, and we created some effects on the music. And now we have a serviceable introduction with introductory music and something that sounds like a podcast. Um, Jason says, you can find music on WFMU's free music archive with no copyright restrictions. Jason, you want to say something? Or? Uh, yeah, just that you got to be careful when you're using music about copyright and yeah. there are a number of sources where you can find uh, music that you are allowed to use. Mm -hmm. So anything on and WFM use tends to be very comprehensive and it's arranged by genre, which is pretty helpful. And when you go to download it, you can look at what the specific copyright rules are around any given piece of music. So it'll say you're free to use it this way, this way, and this way. Sometimes it'll say you can use it for anything you want. Sometimes it'll say you can use it for anything that's not commercial. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're trying to make money with this thing, then you can't use that music, yeah. right? So you, you just have to be careful and read the fine print. Claiming that you use things for educational purposes as well. That's what I did in my old school because I wasn't making money off of it. That's also true, yeah. Yeah. like what you said. So like I had a show where I just picked like new hip hop songs and put them on and um, nobody ever said anything, but if they did for educational purposes, I can do that because I'm, I'm learning how to do this. And if you want to make things, maybe not post them, maybe you can. And if they get taken down from SoundCloud or wherever you put them, that's fine. But just like make things first. You know what I mean? Don't profit off them if you like, because then you're going to get shut down for sure. But make whatever you want first with whatever sounds, whatever practice, practice makes perfect. Mm -hmm. And then worry about that stuff later, because that's what's going to happen. Obviously, if you're trying to make a profit off of it, like you use Drake's sound, like a song he just put out and it blows up, they're going to come after you for that. Right. And you don't want that. But well again... Well, I'll tell you, we're going to later on this semester, we're going to bring on Steve Von Doren, who's a podcaster and a lawyer. It turns out it does it, it stay away from copywritten material to the best of your ability under any circumstances, because even copyright law is written in a very strange way where even if you were singing happy birthday in the park to your friends and somebody recorded it and can prove that you did it, the people who own the rights to happy birthday can make your life miserable. Uh, you don't, it doesn't even matter if you're not making money. Doesn't even matter if you're trying to teach, like there's a whole complicated world. And my advice when you're starting off is stick to creative commons, stick to public domain, go to the library of Congress, look for stuff that's free use or con uh, creative commons. We'll learn more about it in that session. Stay away from copyright. It is a landmine. There's a, uh, there's a show called the H3 podcast that is big right now on YouTube and, and uh, they do a lot. He's one of the only people, the guy who uh, has the podcast, Ethan Klein, he's won, he won a landmark uh, free use battle because a, he used a clip of uh, a lesser YouTubers show or whatever he made and took him to court. Ethan has money. Ethan mm -hmm. isn't like rich, rich, but he has enough money because of his platform to go to court like that. You do not. You are in yeah. college. You cannot afford these battles. So please don't yeah. please don't play around with that. Free use is something that you have to 
you have to fight for it. Even if you do, even if you are in the right in the situation, you don't have that kind of, uh, it's not your fight to fight at yeah. this moment. Totally. There are all sorts of different operations that you can uh, employ while you are managing the timeline. Um, and then the last thing I want to say while you're doing it. Um, hold on. While you are um, while you are editing uh, a podcast, you can do a lot for people downstream by keeping notes of what people were talking about, when the topics change, uh, uh, when there were some interesting exchanges. This is a great time to write the tweets or the Facebook or Instagram posts that you expect to put out on the day that the podcast is released. Uh, you can help other aspects of the podcast enterprise by keeping track of what is said in a podcast and creating shareable material. When you're done, you export the track from Audacity as an MP3. So for example, on this, on, uh, this example, I would go to File, Export, Export as an, M uh, an MP3. Uh, oh, I didn't do that. Did I do that? I didn't do that in the window, did I? File, export, export as MP3, like that. And you can save a single MP3 file. Um, make sure you use a lower, uh, a lower quality file because it will be smaller. And smaller files will tax your web hosting solutions and be faster to download. And for most speech, that type of audio fidelity that you'd need in a high quality, large file is, is not really worth it, uh, in my opinion. Besides that, the next step is to just get out there and start practicing. Record your podcast, try to make an episode. And I just want to remind you, uh, remind those of you who are uh, doing this, if you, hold on. If you create something and you like what you're making and you want to just put it out there, if it is sociology content, let us know. Drop us a note at the Annex Sociology Podcast. If you are a sociology faculty or graduate student from any institution, uh, send us your MP3. Let us listen to it. And if it's right for our show, maybe we'll put it in this series. For uh, Queen's College student, faculty, or staff, same invitation from the Queen's the QC pod. If you make a, a make a, a, a something that you like and you just want to put it out there in the world, by all means, let us know. Send it to us. Uh, do you have any? Do you guys have anything to add or anything to uh, to say uh, on production? Any closing words or anything I missed? Um, I do have a quick question. Yeah. I were to use um, voice memo um, to record something on my, um, you know, my phone or my laptop. How could I export that into um, something that Audacity could read? Just uh, when you use voice memo, it usually records your voice as an MP3 on your phone drive. And if you go to phone files, mm -hmm. you should be able to identify the MP3 or depending on what you use. I don't know about voice memo, but you can also use the share button and mm -hmm. upload it to Dropbox and it will be waiting for you there. And then it's just an MP3 file and you just drag and drop it in. Or your oh. Google Drive if you don't have Dropbox. Yeah. Gotcha. Now, hey, I, think I have a trick for you, Bruna. If you're mm -hmm. going to do an interview and you, you do it with two phones because you want a separate track, one trick that we used is uh, we would count at the beginning of the uh, of the interview. So you'd have your phone with voice memo. I have my phone. And then I'd say one, you'd say two, I'd say three, you'd say four, I'd say five, you'd say six. And then it's really easy to line up mm -hmm. on the uh, timeline. So do that counting exercise and it will help you calibrate two audio sources that oh, might have been, yeah, so you pick up these tricks as you do it. That's why really the best way to start podcasting is to just make podcasts. It really is. It's the best way. 
Yeah. Is there any Let, other? Oh, sorry. I would just add, I've I've only looked. Well, I'll I'll back up and explain a little bit. When we record episodes for the Queen Queen's Podcast Lab, we use a platform called Squadcast, which is nice because it includes video and it records each voice as a separate track, so it's easy to edit. I have only recently learned that you can record audio on separate tracks for each speaker via Zoom. And, and also, every Queens College student has access to a Zoom account. Um, and if you need, there are tutorial videos on how to claim those. Um, if you need those, uh, let me know. I can send it to you. They definitely post that in the chat because... <laughs> yeah. So, let some me, of us, let some me people just, here could use that. Let me, <laughs> let me post it in the chat. Give me a second. All right. Yeah. And um, uh, try to post it to YouTube. Uh, or maybe I will once you put it in the chat. Yeah, All I right. Before we leave, just sort of a you know public service announcement or a commercial. Um, final word. Uh, the this seminar and the stuff we do at the Queen's Podcast Lab, these are free educational resources. And they're brought to you by the state and city of New York. These are your tax dollars at work. Our work creates free public resources and non-commercial scholarly media content and great educational experiences for young New Yorkers who aspire to careers in fields like marketing, media, communication, entertainment, culture, and information. If you want to support the kind of work we do, whether it's online learning series like this or our podcasts like the Annex or the QC Pod, or you want to support our students by help, uh, helping us give them learning experiences that are on par with what the kids get at the expense of private schools, then please visit our website, queenspodcastlab.org, and click on Donate. Your tax-deductible charitable donation will go through the Department of Sociology at Queens College and the City University of New York, and it not only helps us create all these things, but it communicates to our superiors at the university that people appreciate what we're doing. So if you can support us, if you like what we're doing and you have the means to do so, please, please support us. Um, so that concludes our session. Any, any final words, Anthony? Any final words, Jason? Uh, I have a final word for students. Some of you know this already, but uh, Student Life would like to uh, revamp what was the Student Radio Club. And they're in the process of renovating what should be pretty nice production studios. Um, but they need students to organize to charter the club, um, which means there needs to be a president, a vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer. And they have to submit an application and there have to be at least 10 members. Um, so I, I think I'll follow up via email, but I have posted the call for submitting the application that Student Life just put out a couple days ago in the chat. And so please download that if you're interested. If you want to if you want to get this going, we need student involvement and student leadership. Yeah. So I really want to encourage you to uh, get involved and organize. And, and like I said, I'll email about it to try to rally some people. Why don't we do this? If you're interested in being in the radio station, which is also going to have podcasting facilities, live streaming facilities, you can uh, live stream your gaming, all sorts of stuff. Uh Contact you, send me an email, joseph.cohen at qc.cuny.edu, and we'll all get together online on Zoom as we do and, and just hash things out. Uh, Anthony, anything uh, before we go? Um, I'll definitely talk to you both about that after, but yes. All right. All right. Oh, I was just going to say, I did actually have something to say to uh, people. Um, whether you got something from this or maybe you're just inspired, maybe you want to be a part of this, maybe you don't, uh, go out and create. Do what you want and take that opportunity, any opportunity or time you have. Do not sit on your laurels. Do not 
waste time. Uh, there is no time like the present. Just get out there and make what you want. And you will fall on your butt, get back up and keep going because, you know, it, it's corny. You've heard it before, but you're never going to know until you know. I listen back to all the old things I've recorded and I hear the progress as much as it makes me cringe to hear myself talk on any <laughs> platform. I cringe less the older I get and the yeah. better I get because <laughs> like you were saying earlier, you know, the, you progress is so important and it's very, it's very um, hearable. It's very seeable. It's mm -hmm. visible um, in an audio platform, <laughs> but you know, never stop. You know what? Let's leave it at that. What a great way to close. So thank you very much to all of you joining us on YouTube. On behalf of my colleagues, Jason Tuga and Anthony Borelli, I'm Joseph Cohen. Thank you for joining us. Please join us again.